big data. Um, especially, I want to highlight some lessons uh, we've learned from the pandemic using geospatial data. Um, I won't cover many technical details of the studies I'm going to present. Um, you can easily refer to our articles for those details. But uh, what I really want to share are the motivations and the conclusions of those articles and uh, you know, the knowledge and insights from these investigations. And a little bit more about myself. Um, I have a bachelor degree from one university majoring in remote sensing and information engineering. And in 2016, I got admitted to Georgia Tech, um, Georgia Institute of Technology, and also transferred my research focus from remote sensing to geographic information sciences. <clears throat> and one year later, I graduated and then started my PhD journey at the University of South Carolina. Um, after my three-year PhD journey, I joined Department of Geosciences at the University of Arkansas as assistant professor, and I'll be joining Emory University this coming fall semester. Um, in the past three years, I have developed this six different research directions with geospatial analysis and computational modeling as a centerpiece. Um, different from traditional analysis, my research takes advantage of growing data availability using uh, emerging innovative data sources to address existing and future challenges in um, a, variety, a variety of domains, including such as disaster studies, urban studies, and human society, all from a big data perspective. All right, and as I mentioned before, this couple of years, COVID-19 became my um, research focus. Part of the reason is that Wuhan is my hometown, and is also the place where um, the first hotspot of cases occurred. So I, I want to address um, its challenges, taking advantage of my expertise in spatial and the data science. So I assembled a team with you know, scholars and my students and scholars across institutions in the United States and also um, in other parts of the world. And with the help from these brilliant scholars, we've started to tackle many COVID-19 challenges um, three years ago since the pandemic happened. So we have investigated its impact from a variety of perspectives. And many results have been published in journals, conference proceedings, and book chapters. And all of the studies um, wrap around the key term, which is big data, especially big geospatial data. Uh, we've handled a variety of data sources, including social media data, uh, big mobility patterns, and climate records, et cetera. And I actually summarize our results into six major lessons. Um, the first lesson is the potential of cross-sourcing geospatial data in terms of monitoring human mobility. We've conducted a series of studies that aim to understand um, human travel patterns using big geospatial data from you know, those user-generated content. Um, the second lesson is the fact that human mobility is multifaceted and we need to better recognize the disparity of multi-source human mobility data sources. And the third lesson is staying at home is a privilege where we've explored the home dwelling time in the United States, uh, major cities, and also investigated from a justice and inequity perspective. Um, the fourth lesson is about COVID-19 impact on restaurants, where we found disproportionate impact on certain restaurant types using um, the visitation counts captured from cell phone GPS records. Um, the fifth lesson is about the long-term transitions uh, following the COVID-19. We actually found evidence that supports such a new normal you know, in the post-pandemic world. And the final lesson I want to share today is about information retrieval from social media. We found that you know, emotions and sentiments, uh, if used wisely, can provide important insights for decision makers. And in the remainder of this presentation, I will introduce those lessons one by one uh, by highlighting some relevant studies we've conducted.
All right, um, let's jump to the first lesson about how, how we use cross-sourcing data to benefit our understanding of human mobility um, during the pandemic. And, um, you know, human mobility has been found with a very strong correlation with COVID-19 and other virus ex exposure. Um, but at the very beginning of the pandemic, this is, you know, way before Google, Apple, and other commercial companies have open sourced their mobility uh, data sets, uh, human travel patterns. We did not really have uh, many open access data sets that document how people travel across the space and how people follow travel restrictions, right? So um, together with Dr. Zheng Long Li from the University of South Carolina, and we decided to rely on big social media data to give us some insights into uh, travel restriction compliances. So we retrieved around 600 million geotag Twitter posts um, all around the world. And we want to explore how our collaborative efforts and, you know, in reducing our mobility. We actually track each individual user and derive um, two types of distances uh, based on their posting behaviors. The first type is the single distance single day distance, which measures the maximum distance of all the posts compared to the first post of one day, of uh, the first post of the day. And the second type of distance is the cross day distance, which measures the, the shifts of geographical centers, you know, of a certain user in two consecutive days. And of course, the, you know, such a calculation demands a lot of computational power and resources. So we actually develop many acceleration strategies to um, you know, use some hive computing and cloud computing techniques. Um, we've explored the country level patterns of travel distances, which um, you know, allows us to investigate the policy strictness and how people adhere to certain policies. Um, uh, for example, from this figure, we can easily couple the temporal patterns of, of mobility with countries' policy implementation and see how effective those nationwide policies are, right? And from the slope of the reduction and those bouncing back patterns, we can have a general view of the responding back time and how people follow those policies and when situation started to recover. Um, besides the country level investigation, we've also explored um, temporal dynamics of travel distances at the US state level. And from this figure, we can clearly see a state level disparity in travel distances from March to June 2020. And this study only covers four months because it was conducted very early, but we do have some interesting findings. For example, we, we noticed that a dramatic increase in travel distances in Minnesota following the murder of George Floyd. And Minnesota is right here. I don't know if you can not see my mouse, but this, we have Minnesota. And of course, it was the course of those protests, right? And we actually projected the COVID-19 cases in Minnesota with the, with the observed human mobility from social media. And we found high consistency with the ground choosing cases 14 days later. And we discussed the results in our paper uh, in a very detailed manner, so I won't repeat them here. Um, so after this study, we've started to design frameworks and systems that can benefit research communities by open sourcing aggregated mobility records. We've designed origin destination time data model to using the you know, high performance co computing environment, which allows users to extract the billion level or million level origin destination flows on the server side. Uh, we've also developed a online portal, which allows users to you know, interactively explore and also intuitively explore multi-source mobility data sets uh, with their user-defined spatial temporal scales. And this portal actually has been used by many institutions and organizations across the world. So I would say it's a, it's a good success. All right, that's uh, all about lesson number one. Um, the second lesson I want to share today is that we need to acknowledge the multifaceted nature of human mobility. Um, so after investigating um, human mobility patterns using social media records, uh, we noticed that uh, some com telecommunication companies or Apple and Google, they have all released their own products, their own mobility products to you know, help fight the pandemic. And their products have been used in 
you know, in a variety of studies, right? Even some nature and science articles use their products. So we believe that comparing these mobility products is essential because, you know, different data sources only represent uh, a certain perspective of human mobility and capturing a certain spectrum of population. And this is exactly what we have learned in this series of studies. So here we've compared human mobility patterns in the United States from um, Apple, Google, Discard Lab, and Twitter. We set up travel distances baseline using their patterns from January to February 2020 and then map their change percentages from March to July 2020. And the mobility patterns from Apple, you know, are derived from Apple Map. And uh, so when you when, when you query how to go from B in uh, how to go from A to B in Apple Map, it documents your travel distances. You don't need to go there, but the, the distance is documented. Um, Google Mobility is from Google's location history. Uh, Discard Mobility is open sourced by Discard Labs, uh, which used GPS signals from mobility from mobile devices. And they have some collaborations with different telecommunication companies. So this is how they get their data. And from this figure, we can see the general mobility reduction starting from March in all mobility sources, but they do present you know, different patterns, especially in the recovery phase. And we actually did a simple correlation by pairing these four mobility sources and the results suggest that they do present very strong similarity with the strongest correlation between Apple and Google Mobility, which makes sense, right? But this correlation is not consistent. And we can see that cell phone GPS-based mobility records from Discard Labs are poorly correlated with Apple Mobility records. So different sources have different natures. They, many, many articles, including some published in very decent journals, they tend to rely on one mobility sources, uh, one mobility source to construct their um, disease communication models or impact analysis. Now, what we have learned from this series of the study is that we need to consider the, the unique nature of the data sources we're using. And we probably need to consider a, you know, a data fusion strategy uh, to integrate those sources for a more comprehensive, a more comprehensive or more representative uh, travel pattern. Um, since we have collected four different types of mobility records, we want to see that if they can point out, if they can point to some patterns in common. And here we've explored the time series of mobility change percentages for the four mobility data sets. Uh, the counties in the top 10 and the bottom 10 in wealth are highlighted in red and blue respectively. And we can clearly see the diverging mobility patterns between the lower income and upper income counties in response to the pandemic. And we found that rich counties are more, were more responsive and as they present more reduction in mobility compared to the poor counties. And all the mobility sources actually pointed to the same conclusion. So this is, um, but in our article, we actually term this phenomenon is the luxury nature of um, mobility restricting policies, which sometimes can force the poor community to not stay at home, right? Maybe they are essential workers who need to work and maybe they just cannot afford to keep staying at home. And this, but this leads to the fact that the poor communities are more exposed, uh, were more exposed to the, to the virus during the pandemic developing phase. All right, um, that's about lesson number two. Um, uh, so after this series of study, I actually graduated uh, from University of South Carolina and I accepted the job offer from University of Arkansas. And the, the motivation of this lesson, the third lesson, staying at home is a privilege actually came from the moving process. I'd actually told this story many times to my students. Um, uh, as I need to move from Columbia to South Carolina, um, in a very short time, and uh, there, there are just so many stuff I need to move to the containers, and I could not do that by myself. So actually, I hired uh, two people from a moving company to help me, and that was in the middle of 2020, and when the pandemic was um, developing really fast in um, the United States. So these two moving helpers uh, were very nice, and we started to have uh, great conversations 
one of the, but one of them mentioned that you know he really wanted to stay at home to avoid any possible COVID exposure, but he needed this job to um, feed his family. And uh, at, at that moment, I realized that you know the impact of COVID nineteen can be um, very different for different groups of people, right? So I decided to investigate this issue uh, using my expertise. And at the same time, a commercial company named SafeGraph also reached out to me, saying that they they can provide aggregated mobility records at the U.S. block group level. And their data uh, were aggregated using a GPS panel from uh, 45 million mobile devices in the United States, which covers around 10% um, of the US population. So it is a very representative data set. And one of the records they offer is the average home dwelling time for each census block group reported on a daily basis. And uh, just to give you an idea of what's, what this data set looks like, I plotted the daily records from January the 1st to August the 31st uh, from all the block groups in the United States uh, with a total of more than 219,000 of them. And as you can see, before the pandemic, we from January to February, the average home dwelling time in the United States is about 800 minutes. Uh, that's around um, 13 hours. But during the pandemic, you can see that there's the boost in home dwelling time, right? So some block groups boosted their time all the way to the top. And then you can see a clear decrease in home dwelling time after the reopening policy. Now, our study area actually covers 12 biggest US cities, um, not just cities, but city clusters in the United States. And you can see from this figure, we, we want to um, do some data mining in, for residents' home dwelling time during the stay-at-home orders uh, in those city clusters. And uh, from this figure, we can clearly see the increase in home dwelling time in all the cities during the travel restricting orders, uh, but they do present very unique patterns with certain cities like New York City showing very sharp and consistent increase while other cities like Washington DC showing great disparities in reaction. And considering that all the cities are different uh, in terms of policies and local settings, we actually build a model for each city um, to predict uh, its home dwelling time at the block group level. So for a certain city, we have this third HDT, which is the, the increase of home dwelling time during the orders at the block group level. And this is the Y variable, the variable we try to predict. And we've selected some demographics and socioeconomic statuses, variables regarding the statuses uh, to serve as the X variables. Uh, we want to build a regression model that can map or capture this mapping mechanisms from X to Y. And we hope this model, you know, is with great regression capability, great interpretability, and, you know, can handle a certain amount of Coordinality as well. And we eventually chose random forest model, which is a very popular standard, easy to use machine learning model um, that is featured by all those characteristics. And to make sure this model is optimal, we designed a hyperparameter space that used a certain searching mechanism, grid searching mechanism to search for um, the best parameter settings for an optimized model in each city cluster. And here, this figure suggests the integrated feature importance um, across all the city clusters. You can see that economic variables such as household income, high percentage of earners are with the highest um, feature importance, followed by educational factors and percentage of schoolers. So the results point to the fact that um, people with uh, people uh, increase their home dwelling time more during orders if they high, high, if they have higher income, higher education levels, and more schoolers. And for the partial dependence, this figure presents the relationship between the median household income and increase in home dwelling time. And we can see a general increasing pattern that people spend more time at home during orders if they are if they have higher income, right? But we also notice that this relationship is place dependent, it is nonlinear, 
and um, different given varying income intervals. For example, in Boston, we there is a sharp increase in home dwelling time after a certain income threshold. And we also notice the negative relationship uh, when the income is above a certain level, for example, in Philadelphia, uh, which we have no explanation so far. And this article was published in the Annals of um, American Association of Geographers and actually re received a lot of attention. Um, many media teams reached out to me hoping to cover this story. Um, we're, we're really happy that this study can make such a great impact on the research communities as well as the general public. Um, so that's about lesson number three. Um, the fourth lesson I will present today is about impact on restaurants. And this is actually a very exciting series of works because I have seen many closed restaurants near me during the pandemic, and I want some answers too. So for this series of study, we use the point of interest weekly visitation patterns from SafeGraph and some restaurant labels from Yelp. Uh, we then cross-referenced um, these two data sets by considering the similarity in restaurant names and spatial proximity. So if, if their names are similar and they're very close to each other, um, then we regard them as the same restaurant in both data sets. And we have conducted two different studies. The first study um, targets Black-owned restaurants because there are few empirical studies that examine the situation of Black businesses at the city or national scales. Um, the overarching objective that motivates us to do this study is to give you know, voice to minority and a vulnerable population. Um, the second study investigates the differential impact of different restaurant types, like American restaurant, Chinese, Italian, Mexican, Japanese restaurants. We hypothesis that you know, the impact and the recovery patterns uh, for those restaurants will be different. And this is our hypothesis, and we actually proved that. So for the first study, um, this figure shows the comparison of the number of visits in 2019 and 2020. The, the x-axis shows the statistics in the year 2019, and the y-axis uh, shows the, uh, the statistic in the year 2020. We can see that most of the points are below this one-to-one -one reference lines, which means that the number of visits in 2020 is fewer um, than the, the ones in 2019. So um, the restaurant industry did experience a huge blow in the year of 2020. Um, we actually calculated the percentage of visitation loss comparing 2020 and 2019 and further, further used the KS test to identify if there is a significant difference in visitation loss between Black-owned restaurants and other ownership unreported ones. And here we have the visitation loss in percentage versus the empirical cumulative density. Um, the red line represents the Black-owned restaurant, while the, while the blue line represents the average of ownership unreported ones. We noticed that um, the situations actually differ in different cities. In some cities like Detroit and New Orleans, um, Black-owned restaurants suffered more. But in Philadelphia, the situation was the opposite. And in Dallas and Washington, D.C., um, Black-owned restaurants and others present very similar uh, cumulative density curves, which suggests that there is no significant difference in visitation loss between these two types of restaurants. And again, the study was published in the same journal, um, and also of American Association of Geographers. We titled this article, Black Businesses Matter, hoping to draw some attention from the academia and the public to this vulnerable population. And it also received wide attention. Um, Yahoo News even wrote an article to start a debate. You know, does the Black-owned label help or hurt Black businesses? Because it seems such labels in Yelp did not really help during the pandemic as, as much as anticipated. But I think we did definitely need more studies to answer this question. All right, um, but we did not just stop there. Uh, in our second study, we've investigated um, the impact of COVID-19 on different restaurant types. And in this figure, you can clearly see some revenue changes in American, Chinese, Italian, Mexican, and Japanese restaurants 
in 2020-2021 compared to 2019. We've estimated the revenue based on the visitation from cell phone records and also um, the average spending of those restaurants from Yelp. And because of data sets actually provides the origins of those visits, we can easily find the social demographic statistics of those visitors, right? So we've explored whether people of different income levels change their restaurant dining behaviors by looking at entropy of visitors' income. So increased entropy means customers with diverse, diversified income levels. And we found that in most cities and in, for most restaurant types, customers' origin during and after the pandemic actually became more diverse in terms of income levels compared to the pre-pandemic phase. And this is quite interesting finding and that really surprised us. And besides, we've examined uh, the relationship between travel distances and restaurant visitation because we want to see if um, restaurant visits after COVID-19 would follow the same visitation law of human mobility. We found that the universal law uh, of visitation still holds, but the magnitude of distance decay varied a lot across the timeline, pandemic timeline, and across different restaurant types. And we actually documented and discussed this finding in our article uh, in very detailed manner. Uh, we published this article in iScience and titled it, you know, the diverse landscape of restaurant recovery, hoping to uh, document the short and also the long-term influence of COVID-19 um, impact on restaurant industry. And a couple of months ago, um, the Forks 24 News um, interviewed me, and we had a very pleasant discussion about the possibility of providing more support for the vulnerable restaurant industry. All right, um, that's about lesson number four. So after investigating impact from COVID-19 pandemic from you know, these perspectives, we, we noticed that some of those impacts are long-term and might be irreversible, especially in, in the urban areas. So we will begin to see, you know, those long-term impact urban transitions following the pandemic in this couple of years. That's our hypothesis. Um, to investigate this issue, we actually first build urban spatial networks in major cities using human mobility patterns uh, collected from self-records and the nodes of the network are census block groups, and the links or, or edges, if you may, uh, represent interactions between nodes quantified by the, the travel counts, the, their spatial um, linkage. So we assess the degree centrality of those networks, and as you can see, the blue, orange, and green colors represent degree centralities of those networks in the pre, during, and post-pandemic phases. We can see some interesting patterns here. Uh, and if we look at Atlanta, you know, the degree centrality uh, of nodes increases during the stay-at-home orders and maintains that way towards the post-pandemic phase. Uh, if you look at Orlando, the degree centrality of nodes decreases and then it bounces back. It returns back to what it used to be. Um, for Pittsburgh, um, the degree centrality has a continuous increase, but for Riverside, there there's just no no obvious changes at different phases. Um, so the changes in degree centrality of nodes means the modification of urban network functionality, right? For example, the increase of degree centrality at city level means a, a decentralized uh, network structure uh, because of the increased number of connection hubs in the, in the city. So we observed that some city, you know, did experience a, an urban network transition, and such a transition might be irreversible from all observations. And we're still investigating this issue and trying to understand how the post-pandemic urban system is different from the pre-pandemic version from the perspective of networks. And in a similar to the study as uh, to the study I just introduced. Uh, in the next study, we also constructed urban spatial networks in U.S. cities, but this time we investigated from a social perspective. We actually quantify this uh, net networks by calculating a spatial segregation index. And the nodes of the network, which are block groups, have attributes like income and uh, you know risk composition, et cetera. So if block groups with similar attributes 
interact significantly more, we, we can call it segregation. So people of higher income, you know, you only interact with people of higher income. So that's the evidence, right? So we've investigated 12 biggest cities in the United States, and we found that the richest and the poorest groups are experiencing increased segregation in the post-pandemic world, especially in Boston and Washington, D.C. And we have more statistics to support this finding in our published article. So from those findings, we can uh, see that some urban transitions due to the pandemic will need more attention because this is not the direction how we want our cities to be. Right? We encourage more efforts to be made, you know, trying to understand this, this transition. All right. And finally, I want to quickly go through the, the sixth lesson, which is the final topic I want to cover today. Um, social media analytics is one of my research interests, and I do believe that emotions and sentiments from social media can provide significant insights into the post-pandemic, into the COVID-19 pandemic. So our team has conducted a series of social media data mining efforts. Uh, in a recent published study, we've analyzed 2 billion Twitter posts around the world in 67 languages to unpack the relationship between public sentiment and COVID-19 policies. We've implemented um, you know, advanced natural language processing techniques and some temporal embedding classifications through the manifold learning. And in another study, we've monitored uh, mental health uh, signals in Australia. This is in, in collaboration with the Queensland University. We analyzed what the public was discussing during the travel restriction phases using topic modeling algorithms. And we extracted the sentimental scores towards those policies and investigated how you know, public sentiment evolved through time. Um, we've also conducted a study that reviews the public opinion towards COVID-19 vaccines in the United States. We observed uh, you know, decreases in negative sentiment following certain events, which reflects you know, the rising confidence and uh, anticipation towards the vaccination. And for this study, it's used a combination of sentiment analysis and topic modeling. And of course, we, we actually formed our story from a spatial temporal perspective. And finally, our team also a review article which summarizes important social media data mining efforts and techniques under the COVID-19 context. And in this article, we've discussed how the future social media data mining efforts could be you know, less biased and more inclusive. All right, um, that's all the lessons I wanna to share today. And let's do a quick summary here. And all of the studies I presented today are the stories, are stories actually told by um, geospatial narratives and big data. And beyond COVID-19, the techniques employed and the evaluation framework we've designed you know, can certainly be used for other disruptive events like natural hazards or political social crisis, et cetera. So I do believe that with the advance of geospatial technologies, we are more now better equipped to tell compelling geospatial stories surrounding interactions of, you know, human, so, um, societal, and even environmental dynamics. And these narratives can, you know, carry substantial implications for uh, policy making and planning in our evolving world. And before I, I end this presentation, I want to take this opportunity to do a round of promotion. Uh, so I will be joining Emory University this coming fall semester. Uh, I'm recruiting motivated master PhDs and postdocs in the domain listed here. And feel free to reach out to me if you think. This is a good opportunity and feel free to distribute this information in your network. All right, and that's thanks for your attention. Um, thanks for inviting me to do this presentation and I will take your question now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Xiaohuang for your fascinating presentation. I think it's a very, very interesting and inspiring collection of uh, publications on the use of emerging geographic data in COVID studies from different perspectives. And congr congratulations on your new position at Emory University. All right, I think we have uh, roughly 20 minutes for questions.
again, like if you have any question, please feel free to post your question in the chat box, or you can just unmute yourself to ask. All right, like while we're waiting for our audience typing their question, maybe I can start one of my questions first. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, actually we collaborate a lot. And I think the the emerging geographic data provides a lot of new opportunities for us to examine social events like or social phenomenon, but it also has some uh, challenges like a bias in the data. So my question is like, what do you see as the most, I mean, the biggest challenges associated with using this emerging geographic data in COVID studies and also in some other like social science studies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. I think the challenges depends on what type of data sources you are you are using. Um, for example, we're using social media data, and we are we we have to acknowledge that social media is a biased uh, representation, right? People, young people tend to use social media more, but for the um, but for elderly, um, they do not use social media that often. So, th this is the challenge we need to recognize. And also the location accuracy of social media is can be a can be a huge issue. Some geotech social media, you know, or especially Twitter, is not that accurate in terms of its its lo location and positions. So that's the limitation of social media records. But for other mobility that data sets like the from the safe graph or for the data the other data sets where we're using their own, they also have their own limitations. So I think we this this we need to see this question from data to data, right? We need to better acknowledge the limitation of those big data so we can tell better stories. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I saw there's a question from Dennis. Like Dennis, would you mind to unmute yourself to ask? Oh, Dennis cannot use. His microphone. I think the question is, what does big data reveal about impact on brain function responsible for forgiveness in the community? Well, this is um, I'm not actually an expert in brain functions, but you know my study, my um, mo mo most of my study actually wrap around big geospatial data. But this is a really good question. I do think that. This COVID nineteen actually modified a lot of things, and from our experience, it modified urban functionality. It, mer it it modifies human behavior, and I also think that it might modify the brain function too. Right, but uh, my team has no plan to investigate this issue, but I do think this is some topic that worth investigating. All right. Any other questions? All right, maybe I can throw another question here. Uh, okay, actually we do have. Uh, okay, this is another question. Like, uh, can an independent researcher sitting in the third world uh, country replicate these studies to his country? I think this is about like, like digital divide. Like right, because right. this data is not everywhere available, especially in the underdeveloping countries, they have no access to this data. Like, oh, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, so we, we're using social media data, which is a global data, uh, Twitter uh, specifically. Uh, most of countries are, have Twitter users, very dense Twitter users. So which allow us, which allows us to conduct global studies. But for other data sources like cell phone records, uh, we have collaborations with some telecommunication companies. They they all actually promoted their data sets as a product. So we need to purchase this product from them. And this is actually a private. So it is not open source. And, uh, and also for the third world country, probably um, that we, we, we see less, you know, fewer people using mobile devices and social media. And this is indeed a digital divide issue. And we chose our study, major study area in the United States and also in European countries. But I do see, you know, we have a huge challenge in conducting such study or re replicating such study in third world country. So this is a, I do acknowledge that this is a huge challenge for us. 
All right, thank you. And I think we have another question from Karen. So have you considered the ethics of using this data set? Because I think it may contain some like private or personal information. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, this is uh, actually a very really good question. Um, the data set we've purchased actually is anonymized. So we, there's no way we can identify each individual users. Uh, all we know is their trajectory. And also this trajectory is not individual based, it's actually aggregated at the block group level. So it's aggregated at a certain geographical units, which, uh, which prevents us to understand you know, individual travel behaviors. So all we know is how many people travel from this block group to that block group. That's all we know. So we have no way to, to identify them because they use this technology to prevent us doing that. So I, but I do believe that, you know, those companies actually use their, uh, sell those, those trajectories to researchers. So this is actually a huge concern. Uh, we are being collected, we are, tra uh, our trajectories are being collected every day, sometimes without our consent, right? So we do have some challenges in, in this, in, in, in this part, but as a researcher, uh, we purchased data for, uh, uh, anomalous the data without any not, not information of individual users. So I think such an aggregated study has less concern than individual level study. Thank you. Thank you much. Uh, our next question is from Zoe. It's about the Twitter data. The question is, can Twitter data itself review anything about the intersection between socioeconomic characteristics and the varying experiences of COVID-19 you mentioned in your presentation, or does this need to be combined with other research? Um, for Twitter data, it's actually difficult to infer socioeconomic statuses just by looking at users' profiles. Uh, there are many studies that do such inference. Uh, uh, for example, they look at their names, surname and giving names to infer their race, right? And also based on their posting behaviors, you can have a general idea of where these people possibly live. And then based on that location, you can guess, you know, um, what's the social demographic status. But I can see that we, we may be facing a lot of uncertainties if we use technologies like that. So the best way to do it is to couple Twitter data with other you know, census data so that we can have a more comprehensive understanding. Yeah, thank you so much. Any other questions? Okay, we have a question from Mai. Uh, what did your research tell about accuracy of sentiment data across different social platforms? and across uh, geographies? Um, for the sentimental data, we only tested on uh, Twitter data. So we've collected um, billions of Twitter posts and we use a uh, very popular package, you know, very standardized package to analyze its, its sentimental score. But we didn't do that for across platforms because uh, Twitter uh, provides API for us to collect data, but other social media platforms do not like Facebook. We we cannot get data from Facebook in this case. So we're we're only using one social media platform to conduct our study, which is Twitter. So I cannot say how the sentimental score compare with, with others. But I do think this is uh, something we can investigate in the future. If we can have you know multi-platform data, then we can conduct that study. So it's 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 worth doing that. Yeah, next question is from Robert. Like, did you find any issues with applying topic modeling to short text documents like tweets? Uh, yeah, we actually, uh, I can't remember the limits we, we set and in the in the setting for shorter, very short text, we eliminate that tweet because we do not think that it contains enough information. So we have restriction on the length of the Twitter post. Of course you have a, you know, you cannot exceed 140 characters, but if the Twitter, if the if the post is very short, then we cannot extract meaningful information from it. After we re removing those, you know, stop words, then pro probably the the tweet will be even shorter than that. So we have we set up a threshold 
and remove those trees with very few words. Yeah, thank you. And we have another one actually. It's about the the COVID nineteen spread with the with the follow it that like uh, so. Mm -hmm. Do you have the slides? I, uh, yeah, I can I can reshare that again. Let me let me see. Can you see my screen now? Uh, yeah, it's loading. I can see it now. Okay. Um, I believe you're asking about this slides right here on uh, this one, right? So if you look at Minnesota um, in the beginning of in, in May right here, we can see a huge rising in the blue, blue means single day travel distance, right? Yep. So we actually observed that using Twitter data. At that time, we don't have any mobility data sources. So we actually um, use Twitter data as a proxy to understand how people travel across the space. And this is our findings. And I did, I did not do the uh, epidemiology study by myself. I actually incorporate in collaboration with some experts in disease communication modeling. So I, I do not really understand how this model is constructed, but I provide, you know, this mobility patterns and they use this pattern to, to, con to construct their communication models. And actually our prediction is very accurate compared to the results 14 days later. So I do see the huge potential of human mobility data at such, you know, locational level accuracy that can, which can help um, predict disease communication. But I, I did not do su such study. Uh, I, do, I don't have much expert, expertise in that. Thank you so much. Any other question? Yeah, actually I do have the very last question like I, um, oh. I, I want to ask like during the pandemic we see a lot of papers published in the topic of COVID-19 studies but like since we are in the post-COVID period so how much knowledge or method you think are transferable to mm -hmm. some other uh, social science studies and for example like What's your next step with what you learned yeah. from the past two years' experiences for your future research work? Thanks for this question. I think um, what we are offering is a framework, or you can call it an evaluation framework. And um, you know, COVID nineteen. You can think about COVID nineteen as just a case study. We want to do a comparison or change detection, right? Before the pandemic, during, after, what has changed, mm -hmm. and we can actually, you know, move copy this framework to other disruptive events like floodings, hurricanes, or something like that, or natural hazards, right? We can do a very similar study, but replacing COVID-19 with other contexts. So I think my future study will be incorporating with other scholars to you know, transfer this evaluation framework to other disruptive events. I think it's worth doing, and many of the technology we've developed um, can be used in other cases, I think. Yeah, thank you so much. Any other questions? If no, like let's thank Dr. Xiao Huang again for his excellent presentation. And I also want to thank all of you for taking time to join this webinar today. And I hope can see you again in our future webinar series. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Bye. Take care. Take care, everyone.